myself, my name is Austin Kenny. Um, I've been an investigator with the Sheriff's Office going on nine years now, um, or nine years of service altogether. I've been in investigations for going on seven of those nine years. Um, since I've been there, um, I worked patrol for the first year and a half to two years. Um, got promoted to the narcotics division. I did primarily undercover work for the first two years. Um, after the after that two year stint, transferred to um, criminal investigations. Did a lot of major crimes. I worked homicides, um, abductions, kidnappings, things like that. Did that for about six months to a year. Um, and then after that, I transferred back to the narcotics division and got sworn in with the DEA. Um, I'm, I have a federal badge, have federal authority, just like any of the DEA agents do. Um, part of my responsibility with that job is um, I worked out of the DEA office in Roanoke. We covered an area, um, the west half of the state, and we kind of bled over into um, Tennessee, Kentucky, North Carolina. Um, and there's two groups at DEA. Uh, one of the groups I worked with, we did all illicit drug cases. So we did meth, heroin, things like that is what we were looking for. Um, the group that I primarily worked with while I was there was the, uh, what they call the diversion group, which is the group that targets doctors and pharmacists that are writing prescriptions and handing out prescriptions that they shouldn't be. Um, so I just finished a three year stint with them and I'm in a transition period right now. I don't know if I'm gonna stay where I'm at or if I'm gonna go back for criminal cases. Um, but that's kind of my background. You want to go over yours? Sure, Officer. I'm an SRO here. Been in law enforcement for eight years. Worked with the county for eight. Joined town in April. Same responsibilities, um, just a different uniform. I get to wear short sleeves and keep them big. Um, our pay is different. We have less grounds to cover. We have about six point miles radius. And it's usually everybody coming to every call to <coughs> officer safety. Um, start it. Yeah, so we, uh, Jeff worked with me. We worked on patrol together um, while he was with the county. Um, they they cover the town limits and we cover the county, but they have the same powers that we do. If, if I'm out in the county somewhere and I need help, Jeff's coming to help me. Um, we do everything together hand in hand. So um, just to touch a little bit and try to get everybody's attention. Um, I got a PowerPoint that we'll go over and just kind of skip through um, that pertains to the narcotics unit alone. And uh, if you guys have any questions about that afterwards, we can go over some of that. And then we're going to touch base a little bit on like, all the aspects of both our offices and kind of all the things that we do. So the, so the narcotics division, um, all that we do in the narcotics group is we focus on drug cases. We're stopping cars, looking for drugs, we're kicking in doors on search warrants, kind of like you guys heard about yesterday down in Henry County. We do that all over the place. Um, we had yesterday in that operation, there was about 100 officers that were involved in that. And we broke up into different teams and hit houses at the same time to make sure that Words not getting around that we're looking for anything in particular and try to get try to be somewhat sneaky about it. Um, we also buy drugs. Um, there's two different ways that we can do that. I as an officer can work undercover and I can buy drugs from somebody, or I can send somebody else on my behalf to buy them and they can bring them back to me. Um, cocaine and crack, meth, heroin, and pills are the main things that we see around here. Um, all of the drugs are set from a schedule one through five, um, generally. Um, there's fives and sixes uh, that are lower, but it, uh, it, a schedule one is a drug that has um, no medical purpose and it's highly addictive. It's completely illegal. Once you get to schedule two drugs, um, that's when you're looking at drugs that the federal government has said has a medicinal purpose, but it's still highly addictive. So it's legal, but you have to have a prescription. Um, so cocaine um, is, is a schedule two drug and most people smoke it, things along those natures. I got pictures of some of this stuff on here. Generally the rule of thumb, we have a lot of people that see, uh, that go through and they, uh, they see things throughout life and they question, hey, is this, is this drugs, is this bad, is this something I should avoid? The good rule of thumb is if you see something you don't know what it is, don't touch it because you don't know. 
Uh, we, we used to do a lot of meth labs. Uh, we don't see those a lot anymore, but the meth labs were just a bunch of chemicals that people were putting together and they were making meth out of whatever they could find. Um, when we come across anything like that, we have teams generally, generally through state police. Um, the, the guys that go out and deal with those, they have to suit up, they have to put gas masks on. It's an hours long process to clean them up because meth labs are extremely dangerous. They can blow up when there's any moisture introduced to it. So all of us have probably seen this. We've probably seen people that look a lot older than they should be. Um, that doesn't always necessarily mean that um, they're using drugs. They could have some type of illness or they could be sick or anything along those lines. But this is an example of what drugs can do to your body. This is over a 10 year time frame. So if you look in that top left photo and go across, come down and then go back that way, that is the same person in all of those photos. Um, and so it will cause your body to break down over time. You'll, you'll lose hair, you'll lose teeth, you'll lose weight, um, and you end up losing cognitive function um, where your brain doesn't work like normal. So I went through, this is, a, this is a PowerPoint that I created to teach uh, classes for like nurses and things along those lines. Some of this is still very, very relevant and I do want to touch on this. Um, as far as uh, drugs are concerned, we keep track of overdose cases um, all throughout the nation. And these are statistics from the state of Virginia. And uh, I'm sorry, these are national. So if, if you look at the bottom graph, from 1999 to 2004, we didn't really see a whole lot of overdose cases, but it really spiked up around the mid 2010s, and it's gotten even worse in the past five years. Even since I've been doing it, it's been through the roof. The reason for that is there's been an introduction um, for fentanyl, and er everybody here has probably heard of fentanyl, right? So, so fentanyl is a new drug that's uh, that's really made a huge impact on our communities. The problem with fentanyl is it's extremely addictive, and so when you use it, you're generally hooked after you touched it or used it at any point. Um, and what, once that person's hooked, they continue to use it. Fentanyl is also extremely powerful. It's a lot more powerful than heroin, which is what people are used to, and that's what's causing people to overdose. There's probably some of us in this room that know somebody that's overdosed and died because of it at some point. We probably all know or have heard of somebody that's close to us or a family friend or something that has overdosed and probably died, and it's probably because of fentanyl. Um, every time we work a case and somebody's passed away from an overdose, um, we send them to the medical examiner's office. They do a blood draw on that person, and they test the blood to see what's in their system. 99% of the time, it's going to be fentanyl in their system. And it doesn't necessarily mean it's because they're using fentanyl or they're trying to use fentanyl. The problem is they're putting fentanyl in everything. Um, so, and, and when I say everything, I mean everything. Think about, um, so we all know people that smoke weed, some of us have probably tried it at some point. Um, they're putting fentanyl in marijuana now. Uh, they're putting it in vapes. They're putting it in everything. And the reason for that is they're trying to get people hooked on the product. That way they got a long time customer once you use it, you're addicted, you're going to keep coming back for it. Um, I, I really try to stress and emphasize the importance of um, thinking about the decisions that you make throughout life. Um, because that joint that you hit or that vape that you buy from somebody or that you get from a store, you have no idea what's in it. It doesn't even matter if you bought it from a local store. You don't know where they're getting it from. So you guys really need to think about that moving forward. If you're ever offered anything, don't touch it because you don't know what's in it. So that, that right mile is, uh, that white powder in the bottom is heroin. You can see a little bit of powder of fentanyl in that middle vial, and the one all the way to the left is carfentanil, which is more of a, it's a more concentrated synthetic version of fentanyl. Those are all equal to each other. So that one on the far left where you can't really see anything in it is equal to the amount of heroin that's in the other. It doesn't take hardly anything, and that much will make you overdose. What was it that you mm -hmm. could you see? That one. Yep. So these are the, uh, 
the uh, synthetic opioid combinations that we pull from the Department of Forensic Science. So all throughout the state, when we buy drugs, if we get drugs off a traffic stop, if we get drugs from a search warrant from somebody's house, every drug that we get, we send to the state lab in Roanoke. Um, so they test those drugs and they send us a report back and they tell us, hey, this is actually chemically what's in these drugs. So we may buy heroin from somebody and they think it's heroin, they sold it to us as heroin, we think it's heroin, but when we send it to the lab, it comes back as fentanyl. So you never really know what's in anything. Even prescription pills is another thing to think about. There's been times that I've bought um, oxycodone or war tabs or um, pills that you can get from a pharmacy that are legitimate. I bought pills that looked just like normal pills. They, were, they had a stamp on them, they were the right color, they were the right shape, they were the right size. Um, and then when I sent them to the lab and got the report back, they were fentanyl. And that's because people were taking fentanyl and they have pill presses and <coughs> pressing the fentanyl to look like pills. They look legit, but they're not. And that's another thing that's causing people to overdose is because they're buying things off the street or they're buying them from friends and they don't really know what it is. And then they use it and it causes them to overdose because they don't realize there's fentanyl in it. What's important about this is this is the top 10 out of the list. The list goes on and on and on. This is the top 10, and if you notice, along the list, fentanyl is listed in almost every single one of those. They're, they're literally putting it in every time. So those are, those are common pills that we see, a lot of Xanax, we see a lot of oxycodone, quantum pills, <coughs> and those nature. Um, that's, that's the big reason that we work cases on doctors and pharmacists specifically, is because um, a lot of these pills, if you take them together, it can cause your risk of overdose to go through the roof. If you take um, if you take too many war tabs or oxycodones or something like that, that can cause you to overdose. Um, but if you take uh, like a hydrocodone with a Xanax, that can cause your risk of overdose to go through the roof too because you're taking two medications that are coinciding together. Prescription abuse is a big thing. Um, it's very important to uh, make sure that you follow your doctor's directions. If you ever have a surgery, break bones, whatever the case may be, you get a prescription for pain pills, you need to take them as prescribed um, and make sure that you're not taking them more than you should because you can get hooked on pain pills the same as you can get hooked on heroin. It does the same thing to your body. And so a lot of people that I talk to that end up on heroin or end up on fentanyl or something along those lines, they start off with an addiction for pills. Um, and so they may have gotten a prescription from their doctor, and then their doctor wouldn't write them a prescription anymore because they realized they were getting addicted or they were taking too many. And so then that person started buying pills from a friend or a family member, but they're really expensive on the street, and the heroin and the fentanyl is a lot cheaper. And so that's why people end up on that because it gives them the same, it, it gives them that uh, same addiction um, craving that they're looking for. So effects on the community, um, a lot of people that are on drugs are paying for drugs by doing other illegal activities because drugs are expensive. Um, the average user spends somewhere between $20 and $50 a day, sometimes $100 a day on drugs just to make sure that they're not getting what's called dope sick. If, you, if you're on drugs and you're addicted and you stop using them, you get sick. And people don't want to do that, so that's why they continue to use drugs. Because of that, people do not have money to pay for it, and so they're going to go out and they're going to steal your family's lawnmower, they're going to steal weed eaters, they're going to steal cars, they're going to steal anything that they can to come up with money. And so that's, that's, a, that's a big reason why we have so many cases where people are having stuff stolen, because they're stealing stuff trying to pay for something else that's illegal. Um, these were the Franklin County cases for 2021. Um, these were all the submissions, so we had 425 cases just in 2021 where we bought methamphetamine. Fentanyl was 116 submissions. Um, we don't see as much cocaine in 46, and uh, buprenorphine at the bottom is like 600. So if you know anybody who goes to a Suboxone clinic for drug treatment, that's where people are getting their Suboxone from a, from a pharmacy, but then they're selling it on the street and we're buying it. So generally when we work these cases, we end up finding a lot of money um, because people are making money if they're doing, they're running just like a normal business. And so 
County. This is typically what it looks like. This is one lady that lived on the west side of the county. I worked this case about four or five years ago. Mm -hmm. Those two pill bottles on the right were her prescription medications that she was selling, and that's the money that she made off of it. Um, we, found, we found about $15,000 from there. She got a lot of time in prison for this. She wasn't selling cocaine. She wasn't selling meth. She was selling her prescription pills, and she went to prison for a long time for that. What kind were they? Oh, wow. Yeah, this is what uh, is like the prison call for selling your own prescription? Pills? Yeah, yeah, you can't, you can't do that. They have drugs. So yeah, like, like the prison call. I'm just curious. Oh, uh, she got it was between five and ten. And she got, and she'd never been in trouble before ever. Um, so the, the problem was she, um, they didn't, they were kind of low income, and there was a lot of resources that were offered to them to get help. Um, that's what social services and things like that are for. Um, and she was a little too lazy to follow up with all that. She thought, well, it would just be easier if I sell my pills. Well, the problem with that is that little bottle, that little bottle on the right is, um, they're scheduled two pills. It is considered the same as cocaine and meth and all that other mess. They're, they're gonna treat it the same. The, one, once, the, once pills are prescribed to somebody, they do not leave that person. Um, and it's very, very important to make sure if you ever get a prescription, it's going to come with your name on it, it's going to say the medication, all that stuff. You always keep those pills in that bottle. That bottle belongs to you, don't go to anybody else. It stays in your possession. So um, this is a case that we worked about four years ago. There was a guy that was selling um, marijuana, um, got a bunch of money off of him all together. We hit him like two or three times and got about $10,000. Fentanyl was a big part of this that kind of led us in the direction of that. Um, I know I know marijuana is legal now, um, and if you're of age, you can smoke it. If you're underage, you cannot. Um, but we focus a lot on this because it's getting more and more dangerous as time goes on. The other problem is there's a lot of violent crime that comes on with this. If there's people that are selling lots of marijuana, they're probably selling other drugs too, and so that attracts that attracts additional crime. These were uh, vape cartridges that we bought. Some of y'all have probably seen these before, seen bodies with them, whatever. Um, these all had THC in them, very highly concentrated THC, and we found some of these vapes contained fentanyl in them. This is all cocaine stuff. We found a lot of guns when we're doing this stuff. A lot of money and we usually try to time this out to where we can get money um, with the drugs that we can because if we're taking the money then we're shutting down the business. I have a question. Yep. What do you do with the money? Uh, so the money, we seize the money, the sheriff's office keeps it and when we charge somebody criminally, like let's say they were selling drugs, we charge them with a criminal charge for distribution of illegal drugs and that's a criminal case. When we take the money, there's a civil case that goes along with that for what's called asset forfeiture. So we'll go before the courts and we'll say, hey, this is all of our proof that somebody was selling drugs, and this money was a result of them selling drugs. This is all dirty money. So if the court says, yep, you've satisfied the burden of proof, I think this is drug money, they give that money to us. That's our money. And so we can do anything we want with that money except we cannot pay for salary. So my paycheck can't come from that money. But we bought cars, we bought motorcycles, we buy guns, we buy ballistic vests, we buy radios, any equipment that we need. And that's where that money comes from. Uh, in the last in the last two years we've seized about a half a million dollars. Um, and then the and then the group that I work with up in Roanoke in the last in the three years that I worked with them, um, We've looked at about four to five million dollars that we've taken. That, this was another case that we worked. That one was about two years ago. Um, the guy was selling drugs. Fentanyl was a big part of this. Um, that's and that and that little safe right there is about fifty-five thousand dollars. And we took all of that. We also took uh, all his cars. He had really nice cars. We took all of his cars. We sold that bridge. We kept a couple of them. Uh, took motorcycles. Um, he had a boat that we took. 
So um, that, that's one general aspect of, of what we do just with the narcotics division. Um, we, we have all kinds of divisions um, at the office. Um, this is just one of them. Um, some of the other divisions we have are the criminal investigations division that I touched on. All they do is major crimes. They, they work homicide cases. Um, that's the other part of my job when I'm not doing drug cases. If somebody gets murdered in the county, I get called out and I help work all those cases. I go out and process crime scenes. I'll help with interviews, tracking um, suspects down, things along those nature. Um, I also work missing persons and fugitive cases. Um, so if a um, uh, child goes missing, um, if a teenager runs away from home, um, if somebody's wanted to murder and they're having a hard time finding them, I work those cases where we try to track down those people. Um, we have uh, we have boat patrol at the sheriff's office, so we have um, we have a boat um, that's stationed at Smith Mount Lake that we patrol all the time. We have a sign up sheet for a lot of that. that you, um, so usually two of us uh, two of us jump on the boat and we'll ride around, make sure nobody's getting in the, any boat accidents on the lake. There's several people every year that um, they end up wrecking on the lake somewhere and then they drown if we don't get to them quick enough. Um, some, we don't have the boat out there 24-7, but it's always there if we need it. Um, we have a motorcycle patrol. Um, right now we have, I think it's three motorcycles. Um, we have canine programs, so we have guys that have dogs that detect narcotics. We have dogs. Um, we got one dog that's being trained right now for patrol function, so it would be a bite dog. Um, we have uh, two bloodhounds to track people with. Um, we have a bike patrol. You guys have probably seen that up here at the high school or around town at different events where we have people on bicycles that are riding. Um, I'm the only licensed drone pilot at our office, but we have a team of about seven of us that fly our drone for emergency purposes. Um, so if somebody goes missing, um, if uh, somebody with dementia walks away from home and the family can't find them, we can put our drone up in the air and find them. Um, I've got some video on here I can show you the, of the uh, drone footage on some of that. Um, the drone that we have has the capability um, at night to, we have to put on a call clear where um, we can see heat signatures. And so when we put it up at night, especially in winter when it's cold, you can see everything that the building's hidden. Um, our patrol function, we have about 10 deputies per shift. We have four shifts, that way the uh, county's covered 24 seven. We always have um, cops that are riding around and answering calls if anybody needs help. Um, we have, uh, there, we, we got a bunch of different um, areas of the office. We have a domestic violence coordinator for only jobs. He worked with witnesses and victims um, on domestic violence cases. Um, help them through the court process and give them resources that they need. Um, we have somebody that handles just evidence and that's all they do to make sure that everything's secure. functions and things like that. Jeff can speak better to that than I can. He's, he's done patrol function for a long time. And he can tell you all about um, going out and arresting people, the different types of calls that we see and the different types of people that we encounter along the way. Um, you want to talk about that? Sure. So county-wide, they have uh, six districts. I think one is like Westlake, part of Virginia. Two is Glade Hill, Pinhook, and I think part of Three is mostly Doe Run, Henry area a little bit. Four of uh, all of 220 South, Henry and Farham. Five is Callaway, part of Boonsville. Six is Boonsville and part of North 220. Town, we just have the town limits. Um, it goes to each bridge. So the bridge to go out to the county is our limits. So you got the one at the middle school, one at uh, Riverside Middle Market, the one near um, the old Wendy's will be part of that. The government center, and where's the other one? But everybody's assigned to a different district. So if you have a call in your district, say you might be one, you go to all those calls, and it could be from an 
an animal control call that could be a domestic or a larceny or gas drop off. You just gotta go to it and do the best you can. If you need help, then you call for an investigator or a sergeant. Town wise, we do a little bit of the same thing, but usually everybody comes. So if it's, even if it's just a car on lot, usually somebody else shows up just in case. Because we have the less miles covered and a little bit more back up closer versus the county. You might have the closest person who might be in court and they have to drive from here to Wesley to try to help you out. So. That, that's why the relationship between our agencies is so important because there's been times that um, even when I was working patrol or even after, I may have been all the way down in Farrell and got into a fight with somebody or chased somebody or something crazy happened. I've been shot at several times. Um, so if anything like that happens, let's say it's 2 o'clock in the morning and we had six guys working. Uh, one of them had to drive up to Richmond to transport somebody. One of them sitting at the hospital um, with somebody that needed a mental health evaluation. So that's two guys out of the picture. One of them had to leave early because he was sick, and there's been a lot of times that we've only had two or three people available to cover the whole county at 750 square miles. If I'm in Farron and I need help, and the other two guys that are working with me are in Westlake and Park Chimney, that's an hour drive. And so these guys are important for us. If I'm calling for help, they're the closest thing we got, and they're going to call if we need them. And what he meant by um, transporting, so sometimes we have to transport middle people facility for us, I think close to the Tennessee line. Um, I've transported down to Virginia Beach, almost to Kentucky, uh, Williamsburg a couple times. So it depends on where you go and sometimes those are the entire ships just driving there, get them checked in, then you gotta drive back. So, so. Town wise we have three people per shift, y'all have what? Five or six. Yeah. So it's usually a sergeant and two patrolmen in town wise. <coughs> Y'all have any questions? Okay. What uh, got you to learn about this? Uh, I actually, believe it or not, that was a voluntold position for me. Mm -hmm. um, so they, uh, so I, I've been working patrol and I worked a lot of drug cases. Um, I did a lot of traffic stops, was getting a lot of drugs. Yeah. And um, I, I learned how to write um, really detailed search warrants. Some people don't like writing search warrants just because it's some familiar territory for them, but it was something I learned how to do really well. And search warrants is a big part of the narcotics division. Um, so that was one reason that they had asked me to go work that. Um, I was really young at the time. Um, I was 22. Um, the other, I, I think one of the other reasons that they had moved me there and had asked me to work there is because um, I grew up here, but I didn't go to school here. I was homeschooled for several years. So I went to private school for a few years. And so, um, me not knowing a lot of people here personally helped out a lot because they could throw me in a car and say, hey, we need you to go buy drugs from so and so, and they'd have no idea I was a cop. Um, and I was young, and so, I, and I looked at the time, even now, if I shave my beard off, I look like I'm y'all's age. Um, so, so, that was a big part of it too. Was, Nobody knowing who I was, and it just worked out really well. I, we tried it out for about six months, and it went really well, and I just kept going. With it. So, any other questions? Yeah, with that, about you being like any age or something, would you like ever like <laughs> beers or yeah. something for like a, a drug call or something like that? Like if you say if you have like a drug decision, you want to drop like five bucks or would you like cut your beard off? Oh uh, yeah, sometimes I change my appearance. There's been times I completely shaved my head. There's been times I've grown my hair out shave sometimes and there's sometimes that uh, like if it's the time of the year where I have to wear a uniform like they may call me and say hey we're shorthanded on, the, on patrol we need you to work patrol for a month I'll shave my beard off and put my uniform on yeah. any other questions for you like do you have to go through like the basic training program to be like a sheriff or officer or whatever and then you just kind of level up uh, yeah, yeah. So, so generally, the way the process works is like for me, um, I got hired. I started off in Beaver County, and I got hired with them. Um, I was 20, and um, you're supposed to be generally 21. The sheriff's office can hire you earlier. Um, so, I actually, when I went through the academy, I was 20 years old. 
I could not carry a gun when I was going through the academy. So imagine being a police officer and not having a gun. Um, so the, the academy is six months long, um, and then once you go through the academy, you come back to your department and you go through a field training period. About how long is that? Three yeah, about three or four months. And that's where the, um, after you go through the academy, you're, even though you graduate from the academy, you're still not certified until you've been signed off by a field training officer saying that you can do your job properly. And so they will put you in a car with a guy that's been doing it for a while, and you'll go out and answer calls, and that guy's there to help you figure things out and teach you along the way and sign off on all your stuff so that yeah, you're able to do this right, or hey, you didn't do this so good, we need to try this again. Um, so that's kind of how that process works. Once you um, once you're certified and you're on your own on patrol, um, you work patrol for a period and then uh, every agency has different promotional processes. So um, for me, it was, um, I've been on patrol for about two years before I was eligible for promotion. They may have a different policy where you have to have 70 years to get promoted to sergeant or lieutenant. Um, <coughs> yeah. yeah, and everything involves the process too. So if a sergeant position comes open, anybody that's eligible and interested in that sergeant position, uh, they'll put in a letter of interest, you have to go through an interview process, you have to test for it, and then they pick out the best candidate based off of how those scores look.
you can be a firearms instructor, defensive tactics instructor, which I want to be that. Uh, SWAT, you have K9 unit. Um, K9, you get a dog, but you have, how long is K9 uh, It's like two months. So K9, you get to take your dog home, and you have to train in, some of our guys train in different languages, so nobody else can train to like help the dog or steer it away. I want to interrupt you real quick. Guys, you know the deal with your cell phones, you know you're all seniors, you know, and a referral can do what? Take away your disease. That would be sucky. So before, even before you go to the academy, the hiring process takes a little while for me until it took me like three months. Yeah, it was about three or four months for me to get like from the time I applied and said I'd like to have this job. It was three or four months later I finally got a call saying, "All right, you're hired." Because there's so much that has to be done in between. They have to do a background check on you, um, make sure that you've never been in trouble before. Um, they will interview all kinds of people that know you, your friends, your family, to ask what kind of person you are. They'll ask all kinds of questions about if you've ever been in trouble or if they know anything good or bad about you. And they check your Facebook. Oh, yeah. Because yeah. I got, there was a guy that I knew that took steroids and they thought I was associated with him. Nope, I mean. Yeah. So, that, so they, 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 they will do a lot of digging to try to figure out that pretty much all it boils down to is that you make good decisions. Because if you can't make the good decisions on your own, you probably won't do it while you're working. And for us, if there's a difference honesty and integrity. Um, we have to live by integrity um, and what that means is we have to do the right thing all the time even when nobody's looking, um, even if it gets us in trouble. And there's times that we've made mistakes and we have to tell on ourselves that's required of us um, and that's okay. We all make mistakes for human. The important thing is just being honest about it and having integrity and doing it all the time, period. Um, and the job is its not really as much a as a lifestyle. The way that we live at work is the way that we have to live at home. They expect us all the time to be doing the right thing and making sure that we're setting a good example for our departments even when we're at home. So uh, something as simple as like er everybody knows uh, Officer Holland and I in the community and so even if I take this uniform off and then I go down to McDonald's and cuss out the cashier because they got my order wrong, well they know I'm a police officer. That doesn't look good, and I shouldn't be doing that. So um, that's something else to, to think about: is just making sure that you're always behaving in the proper way. Um, aside from the background check and checking on you, you have to go through a psychological exam. Um, um, you have to do a polygraph. You have to get hired, so you'll do a polygraph. Um, that way, they can make sure that if you, um, they can make sure that even though you answered all your questions. When they talk to people, they're still going to ask you the same questions on a lot of detector tests to see if you're actually telling the truth or not. And ask you the same question like three times. Yeah. And, uh, and they ask some crazy questions um, when they do that. So. Can we back up? Oh. Okay. Sure. So this morning I literally had this conversation with my son who's 15 about integrity and honesty. Can anybody tell me the difference or what they mean other than what he said? That's a, I mean, Army Corps values, obviously. Anybody? What's Nobody. the difference? What is integrity? Yes, Chance, you should know. Yeah, integrity.
pretty much one week, that this is actually kind of the nice thing about it, one week you work Monday, Tuesday, Friday, Saturday, Sunday, and then the following week you only work Wednesday and Thursday. So you always get two or three days off at a time. But it's 12 hour shifts. Yeah. So it's 6 and 6. Or 6 a.m., 6 p.m., or you might be working 6 p.m., 6 a.m. Uh, the cool thing about it is once you work there a little while and you start building up vacation time, um, let's say that week that you're working Wednesday and Thursday, if you put in vacation for that Wednesday and Thursday, you get a whole week off in a row. So there's a lot of perks to it, and there's a lot of great benefits too. The other good thing about our job is you only have to work 20 years and you're eligible for retirement. So imagine, we all know people that are in their 60s, 70s, some of them 80s, and they're still working. Um, imagine being, it looked like for me, I got in when I was 20, so when I turned 40 years old, I'm done. That's it for me. Also, I can't draw my check until I turn 50, and I can go do something else. And when I turn 50, I'm drawing a check and I don't have to work anymore. So that, that, that's, that's the trade off and the benefit to the job, though. You're risking your life, that's, but that's the benefit to it. Is, as long as you're safe about everything, um, everything works itself out, you make it through. Um, but I mean, there's not a lot of jobs except for
agree with that. And I think uh, I think a lot of people think that like our job is to go out and arrest people and ruin people's lives, and that's not the case. Um, the majority of the of the people that we deal with are just good people that made bad decisions. There's some there's some evil people out there, um, but as far as our we have a really good community that we live in here. And if you look at the news, you'll see like look at Rhino. You know, every time you turn on the news, they've got gang shootings and murders and whatever else going on off there. It's important to have a good sense of community and that's why it's good to have good relationships with um, with all your classmates, your friends, your family. It's because that community supports what's going to help you through. Um, and maybe we're a part of that. Any other questions? Yes, sir. That's uh, like a good issue firearm? It is. Yes, sir. Yeah. It just looks a lot different. Does that follow you through your whole career? Yeah, you know, we'll, we'll, swap, we'll swap them up every so often. Um, this one's a compact, so if I need to change clothes and look like a normal person, it's just easier to hide. If you look at this, like, uh, you got a nine, don't you? Here we go. Yeah, so, so there's a written up. So, yeah, so his, his is bulkier and longer than mine. The ones that the patrol guys carry at the sheriff's office are big 45s or like this big on their side of their head, and you just keep an eye on them. The benefits of your job. What are the benefits? Um, we get we get everything that you can get from a normal job. Um, we get um, health insurance, dental vision, all that kind of stuff. Um, we get um, the state gives us a certain dollar amount for life insurance. Um, the va the vacation time I think is the best thing out of it because we get okay y'all get the same thing you get right. So every two weeks we're yeah, so they are, yeah, so that's one thing. So they get paid every two weeks. Um, also, at the sheriff's office, we only get paid once a month. So the check's bigger than we get it, but we only get paid once a month. It's very, very important to be good with your money. Because imagine you get paid, we get paid the first day of the month, and then you won't get any more money until the first of the next month. So you got to be wise with your money. Um, and it's just about being good about saving, because all it is, making sure you're not spending all your money on crazy stuff. Um, so, uh, vacation time is the bomb. So every month we get eight hours of vacation time. We get eight hours of sick time. Um, we get um, holiday time if we have to work a holiday. So let's say uh, we have to work on Christmas Day. If we work 12 hours on Christmas Day, then we get um, 12 hours of holiday time back um, in our bank. We also get what's called comp time. So if we if we have to work overtime, but it's not overtime eligible, they'll give us comp time hours. So whatever hours we work, instead of getting paid for, them, they'll give those hours to us in like a savings account, kind of like vacation. Um, as of right now, uh, I just took a bunch of time off because um, my wife and I, uh, we brought a baby home. I took I took four weeks off, and as of right now, I could just with sick time alone, I could take another three or four months off if I needed to. So if I got if something happens to me at work and I get hurt. To have a surgery, I don't have to worry about my paycheck. I've got sick time built up. Vacation, comp time, and holiday, I could probably take another two or three months off just between all of that. Um, so that I, I think that's the best part. Because a lot of jobs, they don't give you vacation time like that. So if I need to, if I need to take a week off, or if I want to go on vacation, short notice, or take a weekend off, or whatever, I got the time there and I can do it. Um, it some of it does. Um, yeah, the holiday does. I think doesn't go down like 96 hours. Yeah, so if you, at the end of the year, if you have over 96 hours, it goes down to 96. You can't carry it. Um, vacation caps out to you. It's like 200 hours or something. Maybe. Yeah, I think, I think vacation, and it's based off the of years of service too. So the longer you've been employed, the more time you can occur. So I think when you start, I think you, you can't carry any more than like 180 or 100 hours for me. Now that I'm getting close to 10 years, I can carry like 220 or 230 hours. Comp time is unlimited. You can carry all that that you want. And sick time doesn't cap out. You can have as much as you can build up there. Like me, I, that's why I got so much sick time built up because I don't ever take, I don't ever call it sick. Another good benefit, you're on duty as soon as you get in the car. So you can uh, take your car home and you can sign off your years that way. Same as yeah, does that work? Uh, the vehicles and all that. Do you get like your title for that? They give you a car and it has a 
certain number to it, your assigned that number, your card number versus his, mine's different than his. So we have a card number and a unit number. Uh, town has three numbers, and I think my number's 111, but my card number's six. When I was in the county, my car and unit number was card 51. Yeah, Why so. I got them that way, that's one of the benefits. So you don't have to pay for gas, you don't have to pay to get your oil changed, you just got to keep the maintenance up and keep it on record. Yeah, the, the car belongs to the county, it's county property or town property, but it, it's assigned to you. And so anything, like you can't use it for anything, I can't jump in Church, the car. Church, your gym, and something else, right? Yeah, yeah, there's certain things like, uh, like I can't, I can't jump in my county car and drive to Walmart and go grocery shopping. Uh, but there, there's some exceptions, like if I need to, if I'm leaving work, there's a store on my way home. I can stop and get like a loaf of bread or something if I need it for eggs or milk or whatever I need to grab. Yeah, that, yeah, that that car that car saves a lot of money. Mm -hmm. Imagine driving uh, how much money you spend driving back and forth to school if you drive on gas. We drive nonstop, and so you don't have to spend a dime on any of that. I think insurance starts day one. Oh my God. So, so 
that that stuff happens periodically, and uh, that, that made me feel pretty bad. So we put a lot of work into that, but we ended up getting them eventually. Uh, but yeah, stuff like that happens, and yeah, we trip and fall. And, uh, uh, we we tear stuff up every so often too. There's uh, there was one time like we hit deer all the time. We tear up our cars. What did deer love cop cars for some reason? Cop cars eat deer, I guess. Um, I've hit I hit a buzzer. I've hit a buzzer twice. I don't know how that happens. Um, it's just like a guy breaking. Yeah, yeah. No, no. College isn't required um, to work with us. Um, if you're looking to go like, uh, if you want to go get on with like the FBI or the ATF or some of the federal agencies, they require a college degree before you can even apply with them. Um, we don't require it. Um, it's beneficial to have your college degree. And um, something else that's um, worthy to think about, um, I had a buddy that worked with me in Bedford County. He went through the academy with me, and nobody had hired him at all. He put himself through the academy through college. And so he went through, um, his major was going to be in criminal justice. And so he went to his first three and a half years of college. He took normal classes just like normal. And then a lot of the colleges will set it up to where you can get your past six months of credits for college by going to the academy. They will give you credit for that. And that's what happened to him. He went his first three and a half years towards his bachelor's. He went to school. And then his last six months, he put himself in the academy. And then uh, by the time he graduated, he went to County picked him up and hired him just like that. And, you can, and there's a lot of scholarships out there too um, for criminal justice. So you know, um, y'all uh, y'all keep an eye out for that. And if y'all want to sign up sign up for a ride along, um, all you all you have to do is contact our office. Um, just contact the office. Say hey, I want to do a ride along. You do have to be 18. What? Um, I'm pretty, I'm pretty, let me double check. Well, what if you get like a parent? Did we do a ride along? No, sure. And when uh, when when Officer Ingram's back, she has uh, she has ride along forms in her office too. So uh, whenever she gets back, you don't want to get up with her, or if she's not around and y'all want to um, catch up with me, I can go into her office and grab one for you. Well, I just texted to make sure. I was thinking that was the case, but I wanted to make sure. Would it just be the line of you call like the encounter when you're actually going to be somewhere? Oh no, you'll you'll go with us. Yeah, and there's been there's there's been times that people drove with us. I'll tell you, we, there's people that ride with us all the time, and uh, it's not uncommon for us to have somebody like we'll walk into work and we'll find out, hey, so this guy's riding with you, and then you're like, oh hey, what's your name? Or you jump in the car, like you don't even. Know. Like, what happens if you, like, chase, like, the victim or the person starts shooting? Uh, we kick you out of the car. But, like, where do, we, like, where do we go? Well, the same spot, like a store. Yeah. Just, just run. 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 Just Yep, see you. you open the door and while the door's open here, you run this way. Yeah, there, there, there's time. If we know that we're going to get into something serious, like if we get a call about somebody's getting murdered or we know we're about to chase somebody or something, we, we've kicked several people out of our car and say, see, we could go in the table. No, that's dangerous. Oh, but it's not dangerous to jump out of a car that's getting shot at. Yeah. You gotta get the real world experience. Yeah. Watch cops on TV. You'll get it walking down people. Have I ever gotten a blood? Like a car crash and you pop cars just like uh, mm -hmm. no, no, I have. Have I ever hit anybody? Like pit anybody? No, I haven't. I've gotten a lot of pursuits. Yeah. No, 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 yeah, no, no pit maneuvers at all. That can you like pants my hand. Yeah. No, we can't block the road. You have to go. We can chase them all day long, and we do. And we have spike strips for that reason. The reason why is because um, you have to be trained to do pit maneuvers, and I think state police is the only one that have to do it. Um, and it's extremely dangerous if you do a pit maneuver on somebody; it, it can kill them. It's deadly force. So it's, 
considered deadly, deadly force just as if I use my gun. Or if it's a lot of traffic, I can't chase right here. Because we're putting everybody else in danger. Yeah, so like when we, when we start a pursuit, we have to call on the radio and say, hey, this is my unit number. I'm in a pursuit with this car. If we have the tag, we got to give it out. What the car looks like, how many people we saw in the car, um, where we're at, what direction we're going, what conditions the roads are, the roads wet, are they dry, is it nighttime? Um, what traffic's like, is it, is, uh, is it two o'clock in the morning, there's no traffic on the road? Clock and school buses are everywhere. And that's a lot of the things that we have to think about because if we're chasing somebody and something bad happens as a result of that, if they crash into a school bus, if, um, if they wreck, if somebody dies, we can be responsible for that. Um, it's like if we're in a pursuit and we want to red light hit somebody, we're a hell of a Yes. So we have to stop at every time. Yep. Yeah. So or intersection. On, on the school bus yesterday? Yeah.
got to, we got into Bend, we spike stripped the car there, and we also got three cop cars. So there were cop cars on the side of the road with flat tires for like a half an hour. Yeah. Usually on a, on a uh, chase, you have one person who's banned for driving. For us, we chase them all day. Yeah, and we've had we had one a couple weeks ago. A guy ran from us and he ran out of gas. That's Think that through. If I run out of gas, I'm never going to tell anybody about that. Yeah, Yeah. Oh yeah, we'll get we'll get them later. You can't like you don't have enough time like to get out. You might go just somebody right. if they're like shooting at people. Like, yeah. Because you need to stop the right. Yeah. yeah. Like, but like, not if they're just running. Yeah, we're not going to run off people for running, but if there's like some of the videos you've seen, like one of the ones you've probably seen is a uh, cop ran over a lady yeah. that was in front of a school. Oh. She had a gun on her. Yeah. And she was running towards the school. So they oh, no. <laughs> Yeah, we probably we uh, have to get my job probably. <laughs> I think somebody has a funny chicken story. Yeah. I'm afraid of chickens. <laughs> Why are you serious? I don't blame yeah. you. I don't, I don't like them either. You said, I went to like go serve in the morning and I heard chickens. I was like, and I hear I'm out. <laughs> but, but if it was like a mean pit bull or something. You'd be fine. I'll punch a pit bull. You did? Jumping, jumping on the dog. Chicken moves too fast. Isn't that long? Yeah. 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 The only thing I've ever seen that scares the hook out of me was a uh, uh, down off the Ridge Acre. We went and tried to serve the one down there and they had a goose. And that thing had, it, it had a like, shark teeth. Nope. That was a crazy thing. Hey, do you eat chicken? Absolutely. He's dead. You don't like them. What? Dead barbecue sauce, we're good to go. Oh, oh my god. god. <laughs> it's like, hey, I don't like it much on my plate. Wait, but what are you scared about? What? What are you scared about? They used to chase me when I was little. On my grandmother's farm. Some of them are really oh, decent. Okay, well, what are they going to do now? They can claw your eye off. Yeah. Yeah. What? She still might get claw your eye Roosters will chase you. They will get you. you. Yeah. When you're in college, you ever like pay anybody? I've never, I've never, never paid anybody. You pay somebody? Nope, I've been taxed twice. Yeah, I have. So only, what was it? You have to get taxed. Oh, yeah. So the academy gets pepper sprayed. Yeah. So which one are you thinking worse? I'd rather take a taste of really? it. See, I'm the opposite. I, I got pepper sprayed. It wasn't that. Some people, it like wrecks the world. 